Good morning, uh, East Coast, West Coast, and to our international audience around the world. My name is Adrian Dan, and on behalf of the ASMBS and the Bariatric Surgical Training Committee, I want to welcome you to another, um, another edition of the Fellow Lecture Series. Joining me today is a woman who well versed in complexities, but who likes to keep it simple herself, Dr. Kenor Jane Spangler, and the West Coast Q&A session this afternoon will be moderated by the chair of our committee, Dr. Matt Martin, Dr. Judy Chun, and Dr. Julianne Lloyd. By this time in the academic year, everybody knows what our lecture series is all about, is bringing together high quality didactics and expert contents from around the world and uh, coming together for great educational lectures. So I'm gonna use this time today rather to remind you of a few things as you get towards the end of the academic year. Uh, first, I'd like to remind you to take advantage of the Be Safe initiative uh, between ASMBS and SAGES and the resources that are available through that project and the opportunity to take the test and become certified uh, from that standpoint, there's been a lot of great work going on on, um, on on behalf of the ASMBS by members of our of our society and sages also. In addition, if you haven't put together your application for ASMBS certification for additional training, this is a good time in the academic year to start gathering those resources. And most importantly, as you get ready to graduate, consider, not only consider, but make it a point to, to join the ASMBS. It's a fantastic organization that advocates not only for our patients, but also for surgeons, uh, physicians, uh, integrated health professionals, et cetera. So a great group to be a part of as you embark on your professional career. We are excited this morning to have two fantastic speakers, both of them uh, very accomplished pillars of our uh, subspecialty and of our society. Uh, we'll start off um, with Dr. Marina Kurian, who will discuss short-term complications related to metabolic and bariatric surgery. Uh, Dr. Kurian is clinical professor at NYU Langone Health and of course also um, in a few days, the president-elect of our society. Uh, joining her is Dr. Matt Brengman, another very accomplished member of our society with countless contributions. Dr. Brengman is also a past uh, president of the Virginia chapter and West Virginia chapter of the ASMBS and um, practices with advanced surgical um, um, advanced Surgical Practitioners in Richmond, Virginia. I will say a few things as we discuss complications of metabolic and bariatric surgery. I always make it a point to remind my fellows and residents that when we talk about these, this very important topic, it should always be in the context of the amazing um, and numerous uh, benefits that, that come with metabolic and bariatric surgery because that's what we have to weigh against these potential complications who are, which are unfortunately the not so fun part of our job. And I, I will also quote one of the, one of our mentors of metabolic surgery, Dr. Walter Pores, who said there is one way that you could never get complications and that's simply to stop operating. That's the only way. So unfortunately a part of the job and here to tell us today on how we can prevent and manage them are Dr. Kurian and Dr. Brengman. So with, without further ado, I'm gonna turn over the virtual podium to Dr. Marina Kurian. Marina, welcome, thank you. Thank you, what a pleasure to uh, join this session. I think it's fantastic all the work that you guys have been doing for the bariatric surgery training. And I love that it's so well attended. Um, you guys, I, I am still home, so if my dogs uh, start doing something, I apologize, and I have to do it here. Right. Uh, these are my disclosures, and let's see, let's get going on the talk. So we're going to talk about a bunch of different types of uh, complications, and you see the list here, um, but there's a couple that I'm not really going to hit upon because I think the other ones um, have so much more uh, acuteness or severity. And so those are the ones I will be talking about. Um, but if you look at this list, and so the one I'm really not going to talk about much is stricture. And if you really want to know stuff about it, I absolutely can uh, during the discussion. 
So I want to talk about incidents because everyone's always worried about complications. You know, you get out. I remember my first complication in bariatric surgery and, uh, you know, it, it really shakes you. Um, and, and I talk to young surgeons now that, you know, have complications and it's, it's, it's a big deal to get up and keep going. But I wanted to touch a little bit on incidents because you shouldn't always be waiting for your next um, complication or, or think that it's around the, the corner or waiting for the, other, the next shoe to drop, right? So this is a, a, a study from um, MBSA Equip looking at the, the uh, bypass and sleeve and what you can expect. So it's a huge volume from 2015 to 2016. And you see that the complications occurred in a little over 5% of the bypass patients and really 2.3% of sleep patients and the bleeding was most common um, complication. What also was noted in this paper was that sleep was associated with fewer non-operative and operative interventions than bypass. So, and of the patients that had these complications, there was only a second operative uh, procedure in 1.24% of the patients. So it's not as high as you think it would be. Um, and uh, let's look again, another study in, in NISQIP and looking at the breakdown of bypass band and sleep patients. And they also had open patients in this. This is an older data set uh, from 2016. And you see that most of the patients, again, 95% had no complications, which means about 5% had complications. Leak was 0.6%. And in general, they found it occurred within 10, about day 10, but that's sort of what we see too, that you, if you're gonna have a leak, you're gonna see it, um, you know, in, especially in sleep, it's usually a later leak. Uh, and then, you, you know, it can be up to 15 days. Uh, DVT occurred only 0.3% of the time. Uh, this is why we still struggle and every practice probably does, um, you know, uh, DVT prophylaxis differently. It's because the incidence is so low, it's hard to get the numbers to really have a definitive uh, answer for what is the best approach because everything has, you know, the downside of prophylaxis is bleeding, um, but if it's the wrong prophylaxis, then you get a DVT. PE occurred in 0.2% and again, occurred later. And I think it's helpful to see these time frames so you know when you can really be like, okay, the patient's out of the woods. Um, and so most of the time, the leak and PE developed after discharge, as I said. And the interesting fact from this study was that only 26% of the patients who had developed PE had deep vein, vein thrombosis. So DVT was not in all the patients. And also, um, I want to quote an older study by Dr. Higa. He published his like first 1,200 uh, bypasses, and really for him, he had five deaths and PE was cause of death in three out of five patients. So again, more on incidents. This is another uh, a review of 71 studies. So they had 100, over 100,000 patients and the 30-day th leak rate was, or less than 30 day was 1.15%. PE was 1.17%, but Hey, hang on, I did put coronary artery disease up there. Myocardial infarction rate was almost 0.4%. So it's something to also consider. And after uh, leak and PE, the mortality rate, as you see, was 0.12% and 0.18%. But after MI, it was much higher at 0.4% as well. And um, in this study, uh, this review of these studies, it showed that the sleeve rate had a slightly higher uh, leak rate than gastric bypass, which I also find uh, you know, is true, especially in our practice. And um, gastric bypass did have higher rates of MI and uh, PE. So this was an interesting paper, it really uh, came from anesthesia. So they had a Interesting when you're looking at complications, I really do just look at complications as all of them as surgical. I mean, if we have to present them at m and they're gonna you know, pop in as surgical complications, but to them, they were able to sort of sort it out and say surgical complications. 
are usually leak and bleeding and medical complications are usually either thromboembolic or respiratory. And I think this thing is the most important thing. Clinical signs can be atypical or insidious and result in delayed management. And I'm gonna give a, um, I'm gonna present some cases at the end and you'll see how this certainly can happen and it can happen to seasoned members of the society as well. And um, I think one thing to note is that respiratory signs definitely can be predominant and can kind of make you go down that, hey, she just said PE occurs so often and, and go down looking for that. Um, and the diagnostic criteria for these complications can be uh, my, pretty minor ones and, and tachycardia, which we always know too. My, my residents are always saying, everything is fine, which her heart rate was 105, but now it's down. And I'm always like, well, 105 is not so bad, but, but it's still so important because you can't ignore um, that and yet it can be the, the first sign. Um, and I'll also tell you, there was a study, I'm looking at the time here, there was a study that um, uh, I think it was also by Higa and you would think we're all taught that tachycardia is like a really common sign and this paper also they found it most frequent of, um, of a leak and actually in his patients when he reviewed it the most common sign was actually fever uh, so that was also interesting e fever over tachycardia and obviously um, you know, if you have a complicated bariatric surgery case, they will likely have a poorer outcome because of delay in diagnosis. So how do we identify a leak? We're doing that by upper GI, upper endoscopy, CT scan, but when we're looking at many of the complications I had on my initial list, uh, we're using these studies. <clears throat> so for leak, if the patient's stable, definitely stent them. And if they have an abscess, you can definitely drain it. Um, unstable patient, you guys already know this from your surgical training, you have to go to the OR, explore, drain widely. Um, if it's feasible to suture, you can stent if feasible while you're in the operating room, if you have the ability uh, to do so. I'm not telling you guys anything new. Um, I will say about leaks in now in, in sleeve for sure, and also more in gastric bypass, those double pigtail stents are really uh, the way to go in, in the stable patient. I'm gonna go through some scenarios here. So this is a patient, eight day status post sleeve. She comes into the hospital with abdominal pain and fever, um, really tachycardic, temp was elevated, BP was low, and the CAT scan shows a left upper quadrant fluid collection and a leak at the upper staple line. She was unstable. Um, so I took her and we did a laparoscopic exploration. Although this is my patient, she um, presented probably in 2016. And we hadn't started with the, the uh, double pigtails. Actually, we did put a double pigtail in her and another patient that came in uh, from, of course, an outside hospital, because thank God I can't have two sleeve leaks at the same time. Um, but anyway, we did an exploration, uh, did an intraoperative endoscopy. There was a pinpoint hole at the apex. And I did, was thinking of doing either um, trying to patch it or even thinking of pulling a loop up uh, of small bowel, but it was so rotated that I just couldn't reach it to sew it or do anything. So we widely drained it. Um, and you know, the usual scenario, NPO, antibiotics, TPN, Upper GI filing showed no leak, so I fed her, and then the drain shot starts showing some particulate matter. So we then did the endoscopy and did internal drainage and slowly removed the external drain, you know, kind of pulled it out so the tack track would close. This was my plan because the, the danger of putting the pigtail stent in and having a drain in as well is that um, you're really just going to create like a fistula, so you want to pull it back. And she resolved, but then about two months later, she had some pain and got a scan and she had a little bit of inflammation that drained track site, which uh, we treated with antibiotics and ultimately took this pigtail stents out at six weeks and her, her leak had, had uh, resolved. I wanna move on to bleeding. And um, again, same thing. If your patient's stable, you can transfuse the adage that I hate in surgery because I just feel like, that can go two ways is all bleeding stops, you know, and um, 
I, I don't I don't love that one because you know yeah some bleeding could stop but there's there's a really bad way that all bleeding stops and it's terrible and I still follow the rule that if you're putting four units of blood in in 24 hours um, and you have ongoing um, uh, this uh, requirements for transfusion then I will take the patient to the OR um, but um, if it's less than four units and they're stable and you're able to maintain their their um, Medicare, obviously, I don't take them. And it's also something to consider doing um, IR embolization, depending on the procedure you've done and what's bleeding, uh, because of, you know, if it's a hostile abdomen, like in an abdominal cocooning. So this is a scenario, um, did a uh, uncomplicated bend to bypass, except the complication was that she had um, many many adhesions uh, and she almost had abdominal cocooning. The adhesions weren't dense. If you guys don't know what abdominal cocooning is, it's usually a very inflammatory process where the bowels just matted together and it's fairly dense uh, adhesions. In her, it wasn't, but she had her small intestines like kind of wrapped and I had to, you know, unwrap everything. The, the problem here is that I always start with the gastric transection. So when I already committed to a bypass and then I lift up her momentum and I'm like, oh my God, what's happening? Anyway, did the case, uh, took me hours, like five or six hours to do because of all the adhesiolysis. And post-up day one, she's a little tachycardic, uh, uh, hemoglobin drops from 12 to 10 on post-up day one, but then the repeat is down to eight. So she got two units. She received two more units on the next day. Um, and then apparently on post-op day three, she received another one. So she had a total of five units, but then she was stabilized and discharged home. And then, you know, the one thing um, was that I thought, you know, it's kind of weird. Like I, I, I don't drain them anymore. So I was like, okay. But when she came in for follow-up, I looked at her abdominal wall and she had significant bruising. So I, I think this was a huge bleed into her sub Q. Um, I do look at my trocars when I pull them, but she had uh, uh, a lot of bleeding. Now, she also recounts one episode of black stool and, and one episode of emesis, but it wasn't a lot in the hospital, but this was not uh, a GI bleed, uh, GI five unit bleed. Okay, let's move on to nausea and vomiting. When we look at um, uh, some of the work that was done with um, our quality improvement uh, initiatives through ASNDS, and also, if you look at your own um, SAR, nausea, vomiting, and dehydration are most of the readmissions to the hospital. And again, it's about 35%. Thiamine deficiency really does need to be top of mind, um, even though we have a rule that if any of our patients come into the ER and have any nausea or vomiting, they should get a banana bag. It doesn't always happen, so you need to be sure <clears throat> and, and resuscitate patients. And then the other reason patients have uh, nausea and vomiting is SMV thrombosis. Um, the majority of the SMV thrombosis is usually related to a hypercoagulable state. Um, and there was a paper by my colleague Manish Parikh that showed that mesenteric ischemia uh, is possible from the SMV thrombosis of five to 15% and mortality is over 20%. Now, I've only had two. Well, actually three, one in a bypass patient years ago, he was dehydrated. And then I had another one in a patient who had some dehydration um, and she was a sleep patient and um, ultimately she was put on um, anticoagulation, et cetera. I recently had a patient come in who did everything correct um, and was really an ideal patient and followed all directions. And he called me and said he was throwing up and he, every time he drank, he threw up. So I was like, that is weird. Go to the ER and um, the ER doc was an outside hospital. I ended up transferring the patient to me. I'm glad I did. I'll tell you why. Anyway, she was like, I just thought he was dehydrated. We got the CAT scan. I was expecting nothing. And he has SMB thrombosis and it looks like it's extending to the portal vein. So transfer uh, and we bring him in and our IR guys were like, hey, we can, we can go get that clot for you. And I was like, yeah, do it. He's a week out. And they went in and um, put the tip sheath in and 
got most of the clot out, but ended up throwing some into the portal vein. So they ended up leaving a catheter in, and then he had resolution of most of it overnight after the TPA, and he's all going to be on, on um, meds for um, some time. So, I mean, and, and the interesting thing was we don't usually do that. I've never done it. On all, and all the patients we've seen that have had SMB thrombosis, we've never done it, but it's an option. So if you have good IR, and thank God we did. I, have to, I owe that guy a bottle of whiskey. Um, anyway, it was very, uh, I was grateful because it didn't want the sequelae. Now, I do want to touch base on a uh, uh, duodenal switch or a loop duodenal switch. And uh, operative mortality, again, with this is pretty low. We don't do a lot of it because we're so worried about the malabsorption. Um, and, but leak can be anywhere from no leaks to up to uh, almost 5%. And um, the issue with the DS, a duodenal stump leak can happen. Um, it's pretty rare, not documented in the literature a lot. And obviously, anastomatic leaks are, are possible. I wanted to uh, talk about another scenario. So, a 48 year old female band to bypass intermittent tachycardia to 120s on post up day one to five and associated shortness of breath. She was doing great. She was passing her PO trial. Um, white count was elevated, but then it was decreasing. Post up day one, because of tachycardia and her shortness of breath on ambulation, we got a PE protocol, it was negative for PE, showed a small left effusion and some post-op changes in the left upper quadrant. And when this CAT scan was done, I asked the team and I looked at it myself to, I said, just make sure there's not a lot of, make sure you look at the lower cuts and there's not a lot of fluid in the belly. And um, obviously we didn't do a belly scan, but there wasn't a lot. So we sat on her and post-op day five was the plan because post-op day four, she looked so great. Post-op day five, we were gonna send her home, but she had worsening shortness of breath and tachycardia. So I was like, get a CAT scan. Um, and she had a leak. So here I am, you know, I haven't had a, a, a leak in a band to anything, knock on wood, right? But, but here she is. And uh, so we did, uh, I took her to the OR, did a washout. She had a pouch perforation. Um, and uh, anyway, I put a G-tube in a remnant and then uh, did a NG tube for a couple of few days. And ultimately she was doing fine. After I did an upper GI at day six. I usually wait till day seven, but we did it at day six and she was good, no leak. And so we um, discharged her. She did need antibiotics for six weeks. So, in conclusion, um, signs of a leak can be insidious and um, your patient can actually be walking around doing great and still have a leak. And when I went in, everything had just walled off um, on my patient. And that's the, the, the key. And anyway, just always be concerned about it. Um, in sleeves, don't forget about the double pigtail. If you're not seeing it at your institutions, just uh, really look at it. There are videos on, on how to put them in. Um, and it's a, a great option because it's not an external drain. So there's less pain. Um, it's better tolerated by the patient than an actual stent, which causes a lot of spasm and pain. And um, these patients with the internal drains, if they're doing well, they actually can go home on liquids, which is really great. And they're on liquids for six weeks and then you pull the, well, pull the pigtail. Um, do be aware, uh, PE is a concern. And as I showed you, it's about 0.3% of the patients, but MI is also something to consider. And I think with all of these conclusions, uh, with all of these complications, time is really of the essence to, to do the treatment. Thank you guys. Thank you, Dr. Kirin. That was fantastic. And I specifically love the, the vignettes that put the complications, potential complications into context for our fellows rather than, than a list of uh, symptoms. So thank you so much. And we'll come back to you for some questions that are already in the Q&A box. But we'll move on right now to Dr. Matt Bregman and a review of the long-term complications associated with metabolic surgery. Matt, take it away. All right, can you see my screen, I guess, hopefully? 
Yep, I see him. Very nice. Perfect. Um, uh, first of all, I just thank uh, Dr. Dan for inviting me to uh, present here today. It's always a pleasure to present in front of your colleagues. And, and also, I thank Chris Daigle for uh, sharing his uh, FBD slide deck with me, which made some changes and sort of try to stay clinical. There's a lot of facts on these slides, so you can kind of do with those what you want. Oh, that doesn't work. Uh, perfect. Um, you know, by definition, long-term complications are after 30 days. Most of these things we'll talk about today occur months afterwards. Um, and there's a long list of things that occur after bypass. Um, and you can see this list. We'll talk about many of these things in the next few minutes. The, um, you know, I think Marina said it best. We ought to keep all of these things in perspective, right? The long-term data is mortality is reduced by about half. Long-term cancers are reduced by about half. And people who are unhealthy are going to have many other problems that are not associated with gastric bypass as well. So keep it in perspective. It's a little bit of 80-20 rule with long-term complications. You don't get to see all the awesome people you've taken care of in long-term follow-up. You get to see the problem ones and they, they can be a burden at times. And if you do revisions and you open your doors to that sort of thing, you'll see many more of them. Um, so if you like this sort of thing, there's a market out there for you. And if you don't, there's other people that want to do it any, in any case. Um, we've done bypass in this country for over 50 years. There's literally millions of bypass patients. So, you know, anything can happen. Probably the body, the most common thing you'll see in your practice is marginal ulcers. This is kind of what they look like. There's lots of different causes. Um, Primarily, I think acid and then the non steroidal smoking steroids. Those are going to be your most common causes of, of, of uh, marginal ulcers. We make a big deal out of smoking in our society. It's pretty good data on this. The odds ratio is only about 1.4 to 1.6 for smoking versus non smokers and the occurrence of ulcers. So while it is important, there are people that won't do a bypass on somebody who smokes. I'm not sure that's necessarily, you know, supported by the data, you can make that decision yourself, but it is um, in people who do get an ulcer in smoking, they should stop. Um, ulcers present pretty typically, they're either non-emergent and they come to your office with nausea and vomiting and pain and like, I don't feel good, or they're in the ER with bleeding or free air. Um, so the standard of treatment, basically after 30 days, somebody comes in with nausea and vomiting, epigastric pain, it was an endoscopy. That's going to be your best test. I use GI for this. Certainly reasonable to do these uh, endoscopies yourself. Um, they can be hard to see, though. So, you know, they get around the corner, past the, the anastomosis. You really got to be taking a good look to identify that little white plaque. And even a small ulcer can cause a lot of symptoms. And so you really want to be very careful to identify that, you know, Radiology is really secondary in this. The ulcer has to be really cratered to be seen on an upper GI or a CT scan. Uh, unless sometimes though, you'll see your patient after they've been to the ER, they'll say there's you know maybe nothing wrong with them. They do a CT and there's just that subtle haziness around the anastomosis. And that can be a sign of an ulcer. And uh, so really engaging, don't, like we're the experts, right? So take all the data at face value. When you're dealing with complicated patients and people, you know, we're all focused on expanding access and doing new procedures. So seeing somebody who's got a complaint in the office can, can sometimes be draining. You wanna just try to keep that bias in check, right? You wanna just be open-minded, evaluate the data for what it is and then have a treatment plan. Your patients will really thank you for that. Treating ulcers, if they are taking non steroidals or steroids or smoking, kind of get rid of that. I'm in the South. We have BC powder and goodies powder. Like that is like tool of the devil, really. I mean, that stuff should not even be on the market. Like one packet of BC powder and you're, um, you know, you can get a perforated gastrointestinal ulcer like in a minute. It was so funny. Uh, my P, we were, I was seeing a patient with my PA who got admitted with epigastric pain and um, some bleeding and, 
and asked them, you know, do you take ibuprofen or Motrin? They're like, no, no, no. There was literally four BC powder packets on the bed around them. So you got to really ask specifically for the things that are in your area to uncover some of these, uh, some of these uh, um, causes of, of treatment. PPIs and Carefade are the standard of treatment. This is going to resolve over 90%. But in bypass, you really have to think about the anatomy though, right? So, you know, a, a Carefade tablet is meant to dissolve in the volume of the stomach, create a slurry and cover it. Like people with bypass don't have that, right? So they have to take either the suspension, which is very expensive and not covered by many insurances, or they need to make a suspension themselves. So you take the Carefade tablet, you put it in two ounces of water, wait 10 minutes, stir it up, and they drink it down. And that works much better. And the same is true for capsulized PPIs. Capsulized PPIs are designed to be dissolved in the GI tract and then absorb. This bypass anatomy bypasses that. And so, so for certainly for omeprazole and esma omeprazole, those capsules need to be opened, put in a little yogurt or something, and eaten. And I think Shanu Katari really did the seminal paper on this and saw a 40% reduction in uh, ulcers when the capsules were opened or 40% better resolution when capsules were opened. So really that counseling is really important for your patients and you'll see remarkable improvement. Some of the symptoms actually sort of pro tip kind of stuff, a little, uh, for patients who are very, very symptomatic, a little um, viscous lidocaine for a couple of days can go a long way to keeping them out of the hospital, not needing IV fluids and getting those symptoms under control while you're waiting for the carefate and PPI to do their magic. So that's something to think about. Um, you know, the data on H. pylori is really, I think, marginal at best as it refers to marginal ulcer. Certainly if they have it, you can't go wrong, but that's a hard therapy to take, like even for somebody with a normal stomach. So if they can't, I'm not sure, you know, you want to go down that route. And then I, for the first time somebody has an ulcer, I do repeat endoscopy. I want to know it's gone. I want to know that they had it because they do recur. And, you know, if it's somebody who's kind of gets an ulcer every couple of years, you can just treat them. They don't always have to get endoscopy if it's very prototypical symptoms because endoscopy is expensive. It's super inconvenient. Um, and for somebody with very typical symptoms, it's really reasonable to treat them on a recurrent basis. But you want to make sure they get better the first time. Um, if they do endoscopy or you do it yourself, there's some anatomic considerations for, for ulcer. And that is like giant pouches. Again, we've been doing this operation in this country for a long time. Everybody has a learning curve and that can be as few as 20 cases. It can be as many as 50 cases. Pouches are bigger during people's learning curves. And sometimes you get in there and see people have left, you know, the upper fundus in there. They have a lot of acid bearing material. That's somebody you're really going to have to strongly consider revising if they have a significant ulcer because, um, you know, that acid bearing material is going to be a problem, probably. Strictures are the long term sequelae of ulcers, and for the most part. Um, and so you see somebody's got an ulcer and then they come back. I just literally saw this in my office yesterday. We've treated an ulcer. Now she's got solid food dysphagia. You know, like she has a stricture. Some people will do upper GI if it's just a prototypical scenario, I'll just do endoscopy in that case. I don't think you have to necessarily diagnose it with an upper, again, testing is inconvenient and some, for some people, very, very expensive. So, you know, you're going to have to dilate it. So just go to endoscopy, get it dilated and, and have it taken care of. Um, JJ strictures in the long term are really uncommon. That's really an acute thing. I've actually never seen a JJ stricture in the long term. That wasn't just basically a bowel obstruction. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, people, EEA, this, I mean, this EEA is still a thing. I think 21 EEA is less common now than it used to be, but it used to be the only thing you can really get through the esophagus and strictures are way more common with 21s and 25s. So you have to expect that you're going to see four or 5% um, stricture rate in the acute setting um, with, a, with a smaller EEA. Uh, way less common with hand sewn and, and linear stapled, and uh, the symptoms are there. Um, balloon dilation is definitely something surgeons can do if you're if you're shameless plug for AMSMBS. We have a course on this. Like it's pretty much the simplest thing intervention you can do. It, it's worth doing and it's worth your time um, to do that. Um, 
you know, you want to try to get it to about 15 millimeters. You don't want to go overboard. They'll lose their restriction. You got a different problem on your hands, uh, three to four millimeters per attempt. And complications do occur. So um, like perforation, for instance. So bad strictures, you know, you just go a little too far. You can get a perforation and then, you know, what's a mother to do? Some people would just say patch it and go back, but they will definitely still have a stricture if you do that. Um, there's definitely a body of literature on, you know, when somebody gets an acute perforation, you see it at the time that it occurs. It's safe to do the definitive operation. I think Ann Rogers has published on this, our, our president-elect. And so um, I've done stricture plasty in that scenario and had good results. So it's going back after somebody's perforated and having to deal with all of that later um, has its own risks involved. So don't hesitate if you feel like you have that skill set to do those types of things. Maybe not your first week after fellowship. Maybe that's not the right thing, but, you know, at some point. And finally, just with strictures. So people who present to your office greater than two years out from their index procedure and they come to you with a tight stricture, like almost all of them are going to end up with surgery. You could try to temporize them, maybe get their nutritional status with balloon dilation, but that's a chronic problem. There's something anatomically typically wrong if they're presenting that late and you're almost always going to have to do a operation that's going to be um, probably unpleasant for you. Um, next, probably most common thing or even most common thing that we see, certainly urgency, urgently in the ER in the long term of small bowel obstructions. While small bowel obstructions can occur from the usual stuff, kind of surgery, previous apneas, internal hernia disease, and all that kind of stuff, the things we care about are internal hernia. Um, there's a randomized control trial that's worth reading about closure of defects. If you don't close any of the defects after a gastric bypass, neither the mesenteric or the Peterson's retro roux defect, um, the most common site of internal hernia is the mesenteric defect. And it's overall 80% of patients with unclosed defects will occur there. That data is actually so compelling that almost everybody closes the mesenteric defect, right? So in modern bariatric surgery, the most common site of internal hernia is behind the root limb because there's not standardization on closure of that. And uh, so many people do, but many people don't. And um, if you do close that, you can reduce the rate by about 50%, but it's never zero. So you have to be very, very, uh, have highly attuned to the person who comes to the ER with epigastric unremitting, epigastric or central abdominal pain, sometimes left over quadrant pain, distension, postprandial nausea or vomiting. Most labs are totally unhelpful for diagnosing this. They can be all over the place, except for lipase. It turns out like a little lipase elevation is highly predictive of internal hernia. And so it's worth getting that lab to help you in the decision-making. But at the end of the day, early in your career, especially if you haven't been like a general surgery attending for a while before your fellowship, like go see that patient. Like it just, you have to get the body of volume underneath your belt to know the ones that, yeah, they can wait till the morning versus the one who can't wait. It's better to stick a scope in, derotate a bunch of totally viable bowel and have the person go home in the morning than be dealing with a much, much more dramatic problem in the end. This is a picture here of the retro root defect or the Peterson's defect, whatever you want to call it. Um, the diagnostically, you can see twisting, you can't on CT. This is sort of the classic swirl sign. A picture like this was on the recent inside, uh, recent ACS um, board exam or ABS board exam. So it's worthwhile to know what that looks like but it doesn't always show up, right? And it can be highly variable. I think actually now radiologists are so attuned to it. It's actually overcalled in my opinion. I see a little more of that than, than maybe it's really uh, actually happening, but this is what it looks like. If you suspect and you go to the OR then, there's a couple of things, right? If you see chylus societies, they definitely have rotation and you need to fix it. 
Um, if you're doing a lap coli on somebody after a bypass and you get in there and there's a bunch of chyla societies, you need to look at the defects and close them. You should look at the defects anyway, but for sure in that person, you should look at the defects and close them. The rotation of the bowel at, an, at a retro root internal hernia defect is always counterclockwise. The bowel is rotated through the defect counterclockwise, always. You have to get the bowel back clockwise. It's way easier to push it behind the limb than to pull it from the other direction. It's almost impossible to pull it by following the jejunal limb. You'll have better look if you wanna go that route to go down to the TI, run it all the way back. The part that's the most difficult part is getting the JJ through. It's bulky. It's usually very heavy because of the lymphatic occlusion. And so you need kind of two hands to like kind of push and pull or gently push it from behind and get it reduced. And to just be persistent, understand your anatomy. If you can get a, your system to get the retractor underneath the limb, a little anterior elevation, that'll help a ton and, and get it done. If you can't get it done laparoscopically open. There's no shame in that. And, uh, and then close the defect try to use some sort of longer lasting suture. Um, and probably the last thing that's really important is these uh, can recur. So you wanna be really be careful. And if somebody comes back with the same symptoms, believe them because even you can use to be the best person. I totally close that. Some people close on both sides if they want to, that's all great, but they can recur. And if they recur, they deserve, um, uh, re-exploration because there's some just anatomy like the position of the rule him as it, it compared to the ligament of trites is really important. Um, jejunal uh, intussusception also pretty commonly seen on CT. There's a nice target sign there. Most intussusceptions in gastro bypass patients are retrograde. So it's a small bowel retrograde into the JJ. It's more common with larger double stapled or triple stapled techniques. Um, if they have persistent pain, you got to operate, right? It's like, I used to tell uh, uh, residents when I had that kind of job, like if you're not gonna operate on peritoneal signs, what are you gonna operate? In bariatric surgery, if you're not gonna operate on people with constant pain, what are you gonna operate on? You gotta, like, you gotta take care of these people because they have all these crazy little problems and you get to operate on them. That being said, we see a ton of asymptomatic transient into susceptions now because CAT scans are just so good. So if the person has transient symptoms and they're not having obstructive symptoms, they probably don't need an operation right then. Um, but something that looks like this with the big JJ, that's, that's probably something you're gonna have to go to the OR. So you can use a little bit of your judgment there, but clinically, if the patient is persistent, they, they need to have the problem addressed. What's the worst thing that can happen? You do a diagnostic laparoscopy and, uh, and it's negative, right? And they go home two hours later. And that's what it looks like. Uh, worth mentioning is the person who has the um, chronic intermittent intussusception, you know, there's, a, there's this W entropexy where you sort of sew the bowel together in a W shape to prevent it from intussuscepting. And that's, that's works and you can definitely do it. And so um, the older alternative is to totally revise your jejunar jejunostomy. And that's like a little bit of a big operation. So if you think you can do that and, and get away with it, that's probably worth doing as well. These candy canes, this is really a thing of the past, right? So the, the shepherd's crook at the top up there can cause all kinds of problems, stasis of food, chronic pains associated with, with recurrent morbid obesity. Um, for the people with pain in a relatively small pouch, just go in there and take it out. It's very straightforward, it's easy to do. It's particularly gratifying actually. The patients are very rapidly get improved. If it's associated with a big pouch and like recurrent morbid obesity, where you've got like a pouch and a really wide anastomosis and this big reservoir, you, know, you got to do something about that. And so doing an on block resection of the whole thing and, and re uh, anastomosing is going to be a better choice for you. Um, it's worthwhile. I'm going to, in the sake of time, only have about four more minutes. I'm, I'm going to skip some of these guys. Um, again, Things that are operative are more fun. So we'll talk about gastrogastric fistula a little bit. So gastrogastric fistulas are fun. They occur, they're way more common in people who had like 
an undivided bypass. They still occur in divided bypass though. So they come in a couple of different flavors, right? So there's the one that's really high where the bowel either wasn't totally divided or maybe the staple line was still very close together and it re-annealed or low associated with an ulcer or maybe a banded gastric bypass. These can be complicated operations and the, the like, in your mind, you're like planning that you're doing like visualization and you're planning to go to the OR. You're like, oh, I'm just gonna divide that fistula. It is just so rare to be able to do that, that you should always be thinking about doing the right thing for patients. And the right thing about for patients is doing this on block resection. Get above the anastomosis, get rid of the redundant pouch, take out part of the remnant stomach, or even um, some people take out the whole fundus just to prevent it from coming back again and then do a nice redone anastomosis. Um, your patients will thank you, you'll have much better results and you have many fewer complications because you won't end up with kind of marginal staple lines and stuff like that. So really an on-block resection is, is, um, is the standard of care and, and, and is, is worth your time and for this particular problem. There are some endoscopic techniques. I reserve those for very high risk patients. You know, there's probably persons who you know, wouldn't tolerate a vigorous haircut. That's like a good person to try this on. They don't have great success in the literature. In my personal experience is they also don't have great success. I mean, but when you get in there, if you're going to do it, I mean, just go hard on that, um, that argon beam coagulator. Really get that mucosa obliterated. Nice, tight suture line. And then you'll kind of hope for the best. I leave them on liquids for like six weeks to have any chance for it to heal. So, you, uh, and it's, and that can be a fun case too, but, but taking it out is way more fun actually. Um, in preparation for this particular talk, I, I was like, I gotta learn more about this SIBO thing. And, uh, you know, this is a real thing. Um, we create many blind limbs of the intestine when we're doing our, uh, uh, and our small bowel operations and, um, this is pretty common as it turns out, you know, you can get small bowel overgrowth with fermenting bacteria, it can give you all the usual kind of annoying symptoms, nausea, bloating, diarrhea. There's some more common, like worse symptoms like fat malabsorption and protein losing enteropathy. You, uh, I never read this test, but I see it ordered a lot, the hydrogen methane breath test. That's a little, methane's a little, a little less common in bypass patients than hydrogen um, in terms of being positive when this is present. But probably most important is how do you treat this? Because if you've ever tried to treat this and you've ordered rifaximin or zyfaxin, you know that nobody covers it. It's like so expensive that you can't get it. And it turns out that there's lots of other choices, right? You can use augmented clavulinate, you can use sulfa drugs, some uh, uh, flagellate will even work. They're just not as good, but, if, but they're definitely doable. So 14 days of those antibiotics and the patient gets better, um, you are, that's great because it's one less person you're having to, to have these weird symptoms you're having to deal with, but it can be very recurrent. So don't hesitate to treat again. And then you may have to actually do something about it if, it, if you can't eradicate the problem. Some people have talked about surgical revisions, you know, eliminating blind ends of like the JJ or, uh, you know, candy canes and things like that. So you can just think about that as well. Um, sometimes you, for uh, bypass, you might have to put a G tube in the stomach and then put the treatments through there to get uh, coverage. Final thing, I think I'll just end with because uh, we just talked about bypass and it's just so awesome um, is remnant issues. Like remnant issues are the final thing. Like you've done everything for the person, right? You've laparoscoped them, you took their gallbladder out, you've done 9,000 endoscopies on them, they've gotten radiotherapy through CT. And they're still having the problem. Don't forget about the remnant. The remnant can have anything happen to it. They can get bile reflux gastritis, they can get peptic ulcer disease, and gastric outlet obstructions, they can have gastroparesis. Anything can happen in the remnant. So if you get to laparoscopy as your final thing, you might think about putting a G tube in at that time so you can do more diagnostics. Or if it's the second laparoscopy, and this is what happens to me usually, is doing an endoscopy at the time of your laparoscopy. And it's not hard to do. You just put a couple of stay sutures on the greater curve, put a 15 millimeter trocar from the left lateral trocar site into the remnant and a diagnostic scope will go through that. And you will be shocked at what you see sometimes 
it is pretty awful in there. And leave a G tube so you can do a gastric imping study, do a bunch of biopsies. You might find some like a little dramatic intestinal metaplasia in your stomach. Luckily, the treatment's all the same. You find something wrong with a remnant and a patient who's miserable, take the remnant out. It's not that difficult an operation. Your main you know, um, complications are basically bleeding and stump leak. Thank God that's rare because it's a disaster when it happens. But in the right patient, highly, highly gratifying. And don't forget to think about it because you don't think about it, you'll never diagnose it. Um, and also when somebody has a GI bleed, like there's a surprising incidence of gastric ulcers and gastrojejunal ulcer or not, um, duodenal ulcers in patients post bypass. And, and that to me is an indication to take the remnant out. You just can't deliver the medicines right there and they don't need it. And so when they resolve their problem, go take it out so they don't have it again. They can really get a life threatening bleed because you can't get in there and deal or sew it, right? It's like it's excluded. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to stop here and uh, throw it back to uh, Kanoor. And just again, thanks for the opportunity to chat about some of the things today. It was super fun for me. Thank you both so much. That was fantastic. I think it's really clear how much experience and insight uh, we have in the room today. And we already have some really fantastic questions. I'm excited about this Q&A session. Um, I'm going to throw this one to Marina first. How, and this is kind of a loaded question. I think there are multiple layers to this. So how important is enteral feeding access when treating a leak? It, I'm trying to get you back, guys back on screen. I'm sorry. Um, it is very important. Um, it, <clears throat> I, I, I mean, I think in the stable patient that I'm going to treat a leak with end, uh, internal drainage, I'm not so concerned about it, right? But in... Um, in general, uh, if things are bad and the patient's unstable and you really are not sure about the next two days or three days, what the course is gonna be, they're on pressors, put in enteral access. And um, I hate J-tubes with such a passion. So I sit there, I'm, I'm working at like, you know, in a sleeve patient, it's a J-tube, right? And I'm sitting there thinking, I, I hate these and what am I gonna do? And um, I do put them in. Uh, but it, if, if there's even a chance, you know, you're saying there's a chance, if there's a chance, <laughs> it's okay. okay, then, uh, you know, I won't do it. But in general, I think it is absolutely necessary. And certainly in a bypass patient that, you know, putting in a G-tube, it's sort of a safety net. I told the patient beforehand, I said, look, I'm putting it in um, <clears throat> because I'm really kind of worried about if I don't you know, I'm not going to take you back to do it. So I'm going to put it in now sort of to ward things off, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I tend, I think as I've progressed um, and had a little more experience, I do agree with one of my partners who says no tube is a good tube. Um, they can often become the bane of our existence and lead to, you know, complication that begets another complication. But I do think, especially when you're saying, you know, with the, the more complex, critically ill patients, it definitely can be a great, great safety net. Uh, any other thoughts from uh, Matt or Adrian about this? I lean on enteral access hard, especially for sleep patients. I, I haven't put a lot of the double J stents in, uh, or double J uh, drains in, but patients with stents, they can't, they can rarely take PO well. And uh, they just have so many symptoms and then the stents migrating because of that. And so I, I lean hard on it. Luckily it's so rare that, yeah. Um, but the, but tubes have their own set of issues, right? I mean, they hurt and they leak and they smell and the use the body me. image stuff. It's just like, a, it's so painful to manage them. Yeah. The pigtails, you, you got to get into it. It's so easy and, the, and it's so much better for the patient and also for you. Because I hope I don't have to get into it in my own practice, but for other people, yeah, sure. Yeah. I would but totally want to get into that. We're coming to your practice for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we have um, a very interesting subset of questions about COVID, uh, which I think is particularly relevant. And I'm sure somebody's already working on this retrospective review somewhere. But uh, so, question one is there a higher portal vein thrombosis, PE, DVT in patients who've had COVID in the past? Are we seeing that more in the people who've recently had COVID? And then number two, should we be um, placing COVID, people with recent history of COVID um, on Lobinox post-op? Well, um, 
I think distant history, I don't think you have. I, I don't think you have to. I don't know what you guys do, but I actually send almost everybody home with a chewable aspirin. And if they're BMI over 50, I do send them home with Lovinoff. So um, we are thinking about changing that because that patient I said, who was the perfect patient, like did everything you asked him to do, BMI 44, you know, not that heavy. So, um, and yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I think maybe it would have been prevented if I had put them on something longer term. Uh, so that's something that's in evolution. And as I said before, it's hard to get the numbers to know what exactly is the right thing to do because you're always going to have outliers because the incidence of DVT and PE is so low that people might seem like an outlier. So, you know, it's hard to really come up with um, a change that makes sense for the few as well as the many because right. I think when you put everybody on Lovinox, you can see more bleeds. And I actually get, I feel like a leak is bad and I can treat it, but those bleeds, man, sometimes I just worry a little bit more about them because I'm not sure if I'm gonna have to operate or, you know, you know what I mean? There's like a little uncertainty there. I feel like we're constantly changing our, our anticoagulation um, depending on how the pendulum is swinging that year. Um, but, you know, for us personally, we use the Cleveland Clinic risk calculator or the Caprini score. I, at some point in time, I think COVID may play, actually play into that. I don't know. We'll have to ask Dr. Amedian um, in, in a few months. But. The other point is the, um, the I mean, Barrage surgery is protective for patients who, who do get COVID. It seems that there have been a few yeah. people that they're looking at the severity of disease and by decreasing inflammation in the body, we're really doing a great thing for those patients because they have less cytokine storm. Great point. So moving on to some um, questions about dilation. So there's a question of how soon or after, can, how early can we dilate? And then um, somebody wrote, I've seen some GI guys injecting steroids after dilation. What is your thought on that? I mean, I'd say early, you don't really see it before four weeks. And so, but you can dilate it four weeks. I mean, that's, that's not a problem. You can, you, you know, if you do a lot of endoscopy on your own patients, those anastomoses are pretty robust. You can do a lot to them very early. So I would say is kind of as early as you need to. Now, if somebody wakes up from their operation and their anastomosis is too small, that's a different problem. So I'm not sure dilating is going to be the, is going to be the answer to that. So usually inflammatory or post-operative strictures occur in that four to six weeks time frame. It's totally safe to do that. Um, chronic strictures, yeah, there's all kinds of crazy stuff, right? So you can inject steroids. People are doing like scar stricture plasty. Um, I don't know about the steroid data. I think the stricture plasty data isn't very robust in the long term. The internal stricture plasty, and there's definitely a risk of like uh, perforation, which is super awesome, as they are not going to be dealing with that. Um, but there's also this sort of, sort of that the little small stent placement. You know, there's that dumbbell stent and using that. The data is actually reasonable for that. So if you're feeling like a reoperation is not the right thing for this patient, right? You don't have a big pouch, essentially. Then those methods are totally worth trying. But at the end of the day, you may have to reoperate on them. Are you good with the steroid injecting with dilation or immediately following dilation? Do you, do you think that does anything? I don't think there's any data to show that it actually works, um, but love your thoughts on it. I mean, it's like Botox injection, <laughs> like maybe it works. I, I don't think you're gonna hurt somebody with that. So that's that's really the main thing, right? It's like, it's like they, uh, I think the, the bar is a lot lower when the risks are lower. And yeah. so we see a lot more funny stuff when it's hard to hurt somebody. So I, I don't have a problem with it. I just don't think it works very well. Awesome. So next question, when dealing with a CBD stone, lap-assisted ERCP technique and subsequent G-tube until the stent comes out? Yeah, if they have to put a stent in, you know, you're going to have them access to get the stent out for sure. Um, that's fun case. Definitely do it. Um, Way better than edge. <laughs> oh my God. Don't get me started. <laughs> I, I gotta, you know, this on is, the edge. We all just had a visceral reaction to that. Perfect case for just because you can doesn't mean you should. Oh, and for you guys who are sake. listening and you don't know what the edge procedure is, they take that. What's the name of that stent? It's like a, it's the specific stent. Axios. Axios. Axios stent. 
They perforate from your gastric pouch into the gastric remnant, put this axiostent in that, that then dilates that connection and holds it together, creates a fistula. Then they do their, they go through the stent, do their stuff, leave the stent in for some period of time. I don't know what it is. Then they take out the stent and, and suture it closed. And 30% of the time there's a GG fistula. I do. Yeah. I, and meanwhile, if we go to the OR, yeah, there's a little bit more surgical trauma, but we, we put it as Matt perfectly described, you just put a trocar in and you gotta put, I, I put a 15 in for them, but- 15. 15 and the scope passes through, the therapeutic scope goes through there and then they can do what they need to. They do a stricture plasty, you know, they get the stones out. You don't usually have to leave a stent. Um, they should be able to clear everything because they're, they're aggressive. I stay at the bedside with them and chit chat while they're doing it because they are aggressive. Because they're like, oh, wow, this is so easy now. I'm, I think this, I think this, the, I think I can cut this more. I'm like, no, don't, you don't need to cut anymore. You do it. Manage. It's okay. We don't have to cut anymore. So I think stay there. For the fellows, the important thing is if you get that trocar um, into the stomach at the perfect angle, it makes it so much easier for them too. Um, yes. And they really appreciate that. So just something- Very, technical. very lateral, exactly. And I like um, the balloon ports for that too. Those work yeah. really nicely um, in the stomach just to keep everything in place. Um, so one other thing on this is that I've also done this for DS. So just grab the small bowel, about 15, 20 centimeters distal to ligament of trites, bring it up the abdominal wall. It's the, and our, my GI guy who did it um, was very reluctant to do it, but it turns out you get to do it with a straight scope. It is so easy because you're becoming retrograde. Yeah. And so don't be afraid of like accessing the small bowel to take care of common duct stones in, um, in a DS patient because it's, it's very straightforward. This is like a battle of age right here. You guys. I'm like, wow, I haven't done that. <laughs> it's really cool. Marina, you've done everything. No, no. I have a question for Matt uh, though about that viscous lidocaine. What's the dosing on that? That's for marginal ulcers. Did I miss that? Okay. Yeah, so totally. It's 5% viscous lidocaine and it's 15 cc's up to Q6. Okay, that's good to know. Very effective. That, that, that's good on you. That's a good, that's wow. <laughs> Quick question while we're talking about accessing the small bowel. Um, any words of wisdom on using the rulin for enteral access when it's difficult to get back to the to the uh, remnant itself? Yeah, totally. In fact, putting a J-tube in, I used to put J-tubes when needed in people with bypass at the uh, JJ um, because you just had so much room, right? You can't narrow it there. You just put it through the staple line and secure it up there. But then I had... Um, somebody who got rotation around it with the rule limb. And I was like, I had to reoperate on them. They're like J tubes are like so much fun. So now I just put it in the, I just put it in the rule limb kind of as close as I can get to the ligament of trites that'll come up to prevent that. And there's, because it's only bile going by, you can't really narrow it. You mean the BP limb? The BP, I'm sorry, BP limb. You're exactly right. Yeah, I, I would put it in the BP limb myself. I wouldn't put, uh... Um, the other thing that I always think of, like I said to you guys in sleep, and I meant to say it when you asked about it, was uh, if they can do like a nasojejunal yeah. tube feed or something. I mean, I really sit there thinking, how much will my patient hate me if we put a nasojejunal tube feeding? A lot, in? man. They really hate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm, a lot. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All is painful. We'll Nothing says so sick like a tube coming out of your nose. Attached to oh, no tube is a good tube. A yeah. um, couple other questions. Somebody asked about endoscopic internal draining and Adrian, I think check, we do have several um, archived webinars on this. So please feel free to check those out. They're available. You don't have to have a password or anything on the ASMBS website. If you just type in fellow webinar uh, ASMBS on Google, it'll take you to the right page. Um, somebody else asked, is there a 15 millimeter balloon port? Yes, there is. Applied makes it. It comes in a 10 centimeter, 12 centimeter, and 15 centimeter length. Um, and those are great for that intragastric um, placement. 
Um, and then I was just going to say, I didn't realize how many of you um, Northerners did not know what VC and goodies was. So when we do our listing, when I talk to patients, I always say, so are you taking any aspirin, ibuprofen, Aleve, meloxicam, BC powder, goodies powder? I have a list. Um, I sound like an auctioneer. And inevitably, probably 25% of them are like, well, I take four BCs a day. What's wrong with that? And you have to remind them that it is powdered aspirin. So um, for any fellows who are relocating from up north down here to um, the BC powder, goody powder land, add that to your list of things to ask about. Uh, also, I think Matt, you made a really great point. I just wanted to discuss it for a second about finding ulcers, marginal ulcers. You really have to, if you're the, if this is something you're going to put into your endoscopic skill set, I think I always harp on my fellows and make sure they're actually trying to retro retroflex, not just in the pouch, but in the rule limb. So go a little bit into the rule limb and retroflex, because if you think about where marginal ulcers live, sometimes it's on that posterior surface of the GJ and you're not going to see them. Um, so just something to kind of try adding your skill set. I, I, have so much agita, agita about retroflexing the rule limb. Like, okay, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. You must leave a really long blinded limb. See, this is how surgeons battle each other, right? Like, <laughs> I'm like I will say it, it so comes cool. with you She's do have to flex at the rule limb. When the GI guys show me that view, I'm like, you, what did you? you know. <laughs> it's a lot of twisting and turning and feeling your resistance and making sure you're not messing anything up. Um, but I do think when you when you do it and you find the ulcer, oh man, that's so gratifying. Um, I'm going to go assume. I'm just going to assume. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think that's all the questions that we did have um, in the Q and A in the chat. Adrian, if you don't have anything else, I think we can probably wrap it up. Yes, I want to thank our speakers uh, once again um, for your time and your efforts, especially uh, at a point in time when we're all getting ready for a national meeting in Dallas. I'm sure you guys have a lot of, um, of responsibilities there. Matter of fact, I know um, your, your knowledge, your expertise, uh, coupled with your clinical experiences really shine through today. So I want to thank you guys for that. And the this is a vast subject and the degree to, to which you are able to cover it is remarkable. So thank you once again, and we look forward to seeing you this afternoon for the West Coast session, 345 Eastern Standard Time for 15 minutes. It's okay from you're anywhere. Yeah, if, you, if you're on a flight, we understand. And if you're in the OR, you could even, yeah, we've had people just from the substeral room, but whatever you can do. And we look forward to having you back for future lectures. So thank you all and see you all in Dallas. Y'all, y'all, is that right? I'll y'all later. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Pinar. Thanks so Thank much. You. Bye. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining us for the uh, afternoon session. Uh, I'm here with my co-moderators, Dr. Julianne Lloyd and Dr. Judy Chen. And uh, Dr. Brangman, it, it looks like uh, Dr. Kurian uh, was unable to make it, so you're our sole target for questions. Um, I'm going to start off, and uh, you talked about approaching uh, gastrogastric fistulas. And I've had one or two of these. How do you handle the patient? They had bypass a couple years ago. They get a CT scan for some reason, and there's a GG fistula, but they're essentially asymptomatic from it. So contrast goes right into the remnant, but they really have no symptoms from it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times you you don't even see that person, right? And they just don't get to your office. They usually get to you for some reason. Um, if the reason is like weight gain, that's nice because you get for some insurance policies, you get to go to the OR and do something about bad anatomy. The more troublesome of that scenario is the person has like really vague abdominal pain and they've got some tiny little fistula and it's like, is that really it? But honestly, um, you know, with more and more patients aging out of open bypass. And that's not to say they're not out there, but they're less frequent than they used to be. These operations are less challenging and much, much safer. And so I'm not sure I would totally approach a totally asymptomatic person, but there's not that many asymptomatic fistulas out there. I don't think. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Julianne. You're on mute, Julianne. Thank you. That was like a rookie move of me. <laughs> um, I thought both presentations are really, really good. Um, 
Dr. Bergman, I do have a comment and a question for you. So the first thing is kind of my own personal soapbox. You did mention doing um, an endoscopy at the time of laparoscopy. So I would encourage uh, residents, fellows, anybody who's watching, usually for the bariatric patients, if you know we take them back for any reason um, to do something laparoscopic, the patient is on the anesthesia. So you know, I would encourage you guys to just go ahead and do an endoscopy because you might diagnose a marginal ulcer at that time. And you would be kicking yourself in the butt afterwards if you've done this elaborate um, take back for like internal hernia. And two weeks later, it turns out the patient has abdominal pain for marginal also. Um, so that was the first thing. The second thing I wanted to ask you is about gastric bypass reversal. Have you had to do that in any of your patients and what were the indications? Um, how did you manage it and what kind of outcomes did you find? Yeah, so I, um... I probably do one of these a year, and um, which is plenty, I think. They're um, almost always for uh, chronic ulcer or chronic recurrent ulcer. There's a little bit of, um, you know, when you're doing your decision making, you know, I think everybody's going to revise the first ulcer, right? Let's just, you know, they don't want to gain their weight back. If you're thinking about doing another, ulcer excision and reanastomosis. I think you need to think hard about that one because that's about the time you run out of pouch to reverse to. And so you just wanna have that in the back of your mind. Is this the right person? Is this really the anatomy? Now, if somebody else has revised them and they get to you, then it's all bets are off because I'm about to do this on somebody whose pouch is still gigantic. And so it's really about the anatomy. So being very thoughtful about your anatomic valuation you know, just because somebody else did something, you know, start from scratch, that's always worthwhile. Other indications for chronic or other indications for reversal, every once in a while you get the person who gets intractable nausea after bypass. My policy is I'll wait a year for those people to get better. But if after, if after a year, they're still miserable and they're miserable if, they're, if they've gotten to a year, they usually want to be reversed and I'll do that operation on them. And then the final indication is typically um, uh, late dumping syndrome that just can't be managed. And, the, and you just gotta uh, bite the bullet and reverse them. Problem is their emptying is gonna be totally crappy afterwards. I've never reversed somebody who hasn't had delayed emptying on their stomach. It's so frequent now I do a pyloroplasty at the time of reversal. And uh, that's a little harder when, uh, when you're dealing with the dumping problem, but um, you know, so you have to decide if you're willing to sort of let them go and see if they be okay without pyloroplasty and risk having to do another procedure on them. But so it's some complex thinking, you know, you usually get to know these patients very, very well. And so you can have these really frank conversations about the pluses and minuses and have that relationship. Um, I would love to jump on that answer uh, in regards to, yes, the patients you get to know well, and they really do kind of erode because of the nausea or the, the that second reason you said for reversing someone. Um, and so may I ask, when you are facing with somebody early in the post-op period, six weeks, three months, do you start moving to feeding tube? And then like, do you do any other testing to help you kind of really move forward with a reversal such as motility studies, you know, um, the patient I have in my mind, you know, already has like a lot of global motility as well. Um, you know, like one bowel movement a week, yeah. sometimes two weeks. And then also in addition to that, um, just medications, you know, I think there may be some possible evidence of just like the sensitivity of the esophagus that causes such nausea, you know, cause mechanically your endoscopy looks good, you're, it's flowing through with the contrast, you know, there's no mechanical reason it feels like, except you have a miserable patient and then how to like work through the year with that miserable patient. Yeah, oh, those are all great observations. And I mean, I don't think anybody's really cornered the market on this. I think, I think my protocol for a year is that um, we know from some really elegant studies done back in the 70s that direct IV infusion of GLP-1 causes significant nausea. We also know that our operations cause really high levels of GLP-1. We also know that 
the main side effect of Wagovi and Saxenda, all these medicines is nausea and vomiting, right? So I think all the evidence is there. We also know that our operations in the hunger control, you know, kind of ends after about a year. And that is probably a reduction or an adaptation to GLP-1 over time. That's why I give them a year because every once in a while, they'll get better after a year and they'll be like, okay, let's go. You know, the kind of, it's like the person who wakes up at six months and they're like, hey, I'm not nauseated today. And suddenly they're all better. And you're like, whatever, but you have to support them. Right. And so G tubes and the remnant, that's like the mainstay of therapy, right? These people get very malnourished. They'll get, you know, vitamin deficiency and everything. And so a G tube and the remnant typically is quite helpful. Um, try not to do TPN too much because of the side effects and all that stuff. Um, and then motility disorders are kind of like a different thing. And, and I've been burned by this for sure. Somebody who has a global gut motility disorder where the small bowel is very much affected, there's like almost no helping them, honestly. And when diagnosed, when I've diagnosed that, I send them to a transplant center, honestly, and try to figure out if they can do something for them because more surgery is almost never the answer. And, if, and, and a lot of times the patient will say, oh yeah, I had lots of problems before this surgery and now I'm just a little worse. I'm like, oh, been nice to know that. Um, ahead of time, so we could have dodged that bullet. Um, and then there was one more scenario that you had mentioned. Um, Medications. I just wonder, you know, like you said, that nausea, so this particular patient again, severe yeah. hyperemesis gravidum, like just, and so it feels so chemical too, you know, like you mentioned GLP, something with this nausea. And so are there medications even that you try between now and oh, yeah. I mean, like, your next intervention? You can, you can try them all. I've tried, I've literally tried them all. So, um, you know, you can, in the, in the tricyclic antidepressants, you know, you got to try those. Those are sometimes quite helpful. Uh, mirtazapine or Remeron, you know, you can go pretty high doses with that. That can be quite helpful. Um, sometimes buce bars. It can be really helpful to, you know, that's an accommodation agent for the stomach. So it causes, it just causes everything to relax a little bit. And people have seen good nausea results with that. Um, I have used um, chronic administration of GI cocktail. So that's like direct application of belladonna and um, Lidocaine can sometimes be quite helpful. It's really well tolerated, actually. People can take a lot of that stuff if it works and, and really not have very many side effects. Um, another thing, I, like I went on this like journey to prevent nausea one time. And so I read a bunch of papers. Like there's this great paper by this guy, um, Dr. No, N-O-H from Japan. It's from the 80s. And he did a lot of bypass style operations. And um really, I think, did a great job identifying that division of the mesenteric of the mesentery is really important to nausea post-op. So when after I read that, and it's a great paper if you can find it because he's got all, all the all the drawings are hand drawn by him. And so it's like these like sketchbook of drawings. Um, and so I've uh, so I I've, I switched to Omega Loop because of that. And um, so that I, there's no division of the mesentery, right? The bowel, only the bowel is divided um, just proximal to the JJ and, or at the GJ and then make a little bit of a blind limb so the JJ sits a little lower so you don't end up with that sort of weird obstruction. So, and and I, I think that has worked. I, I, I should probably be better about this prospective data thing, but those are those are some of the tools out there, I think. Thank you. I mean, this is just a big part of what we work with, right? It's one or two patients, you know, a handful, but it really is a part of our um, practice. And it's also on the community too, because it struggles um, in the ER and everywhere. And so I think that's part of some of the things that we don't get talk, discuss, further discussion in fellowship, you know, and I think it's great that this um, is discussed right now, but I know that there are Q and A. I think Dr. Lloyd, if you wanted to. Yeah. So sure. um, <laughs> it's okay. We have a couple questions from the audience. Um, I do want to ask you a quick follow up about something that you just mentioned um, about doing the omega loop. Is that only robotic, or are you also doing that for you laparoscopic cases? 
I actually started doing laparoscopically before I started doing a robotics. So it made the transition to robotics very easy, but um, yeah, it's totally doable in a very efficient operation laparoscopically. Okay, um, great. So the first one from the audience is about the marginal ulcers. Um, do you consider chronic steroid use to be a contraindication for uh, doing a bypass on a patient? Um, it's like a, it's like a stop and think about it kind of thing. You know, I think probably it's better to do a sleeve. Unless if you have the opportunity to do a sleeve, the patient is right for a sleeve. A sleeve is probably a better operation for people on chronic steroids. However, there's lots of people on chronic steroids who show up with a BMI of 55. And then like, then, then what are you going to do? Right? Because somebody on steroids BMI 55, they're, they may, you know, maybe they're pre-transplant, right? They're never going to get to a BMI of 40 with a sleeve. Like that's just not a thing. So I think you have to think hard about it. I don't, I think chronic steroids are not quite so bad. It's the people that get the big pulses, right? So it's the asthmatics that get 80 of prednisone for a week. And in the go from zero to a hundred, like overnight, like, I think that's, I think more correlated with chronic or with G acute perforation and acute ulceration than, than the person who just takes five of prednisone every day. Um, okay, and the next question is about whether you've used Cytotec in the past um, for marginal ulcer treatment. I've not used it. I, I read that question, saw that question come up like, oh, that's probably, not, maybe that's a good idea. I, I've, I've never used it. I've just used the standard stuff and that seems to yeah. work. Um, the one thing that's on the horizon, I didn't mention it in my talk, and I and I meant to because I, I've thought about doing it now a couple of times, but I haven't had the kind of the right person, is this oversewing the ulcer. You know, that seems like that looks like magic, right? So let's, you know, they're better in like a day. So I totally want to do that when the right patient comes around. I don't want to ever have that patient, but when that patient does come around, I want to try that because it seems that the data has just been so remarkable. Now, it's a, for those of you that do and aluminal suturing, you know, there's a lot, of, there's a lot to that. So the pouch has to be the right size. It can't be too angulated, all that. The anastomosis has to be wide enough to get the thing through the anastomosis to grab the opposite side. But if all these things are in play, it could be pretty fun. Um, I think another question from the Q&A was um, the closure of the defects, absorbable versus non-absorbable. Uh, I've done both where um, I was taught absorbable initially, but I've moved to non-absorbable now. I don't know what everyone else is. is yeah, I'd be interested in sort of what's the poll the audience on this one. Um, I use PDS, so I guess that's absorbable. Um, but I've gone back on, I used to use, and my partner used to use silk, and I've been back and never seen that silk there. So, and that's supposedly permanent too. Silk is definitely not permanent. So, um, we're really looking for the healing, right? It's not the suture that's gonna hold this together. They're either gonna get the inflammation and enclose it or not. And uh, uh, when um, I did actually, since, the, since this morning, I pulled the paper on the randomized trial because it's like so great. Um, and uh, in the, there was 25% um, of the rate of internal hernia for when the defects were closed with permanent suture versus not closed at all. So it's a big reduction, but it's not zero. Yeah, I always use permanent. Uh, I was taught that way and I just get very nervous about even going back like six months and then not seeing enough, um, as you said, inflammation. So I've always used either Surgidac or like the permanent robotic um, stitch. Yeah. All right, we are we are super over time. Um, oh, I do appreciate you taking some extra time talking with us. No, this is great. I think you know we're able to get through um, the majority of the audience questions. Um, but thank you to both of our speakers today with excellent presentations, and to Dr. Martin who had to log off a little early, and my co-moderator Dr. Chen as well. Um, I guess we will see most of you guys in Dallas hopefully next week. Um, otherwise, we'll reconvene in another month with some more talks um, with information to follow. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing all the information. My pleasure. It was great to meet you guys and, uh, and, uh, and I look forward to seeing you in Dallas.